Well, hi everyone, I'm Julie Ristow and I'm here from uh, Minnesota. Um, I grew up on a farm right on the Iowa-Minnesota border at a time when the still had small, diverse farms, um, 160 acres and very extended family and I saw all of that way of life and those kinds of communal conditions and sharing economy just sort of wither over a 40 year period. So I've, um, I've worked a lot with farmers in my life. I was very devoted to agriculture. I was a hog breeder for many years. Um, I ended up <clears throat> working in southern Minnesota for a number of years during the farm crisis, which really never went away. Uh, and over the last 10 years, I've just been really devoted to wanting to find ways to help us restore and um, bring back the vitality of our rural communities. And at the heart of that is agriculture, and at the heart of that is our soil. So I've just devoted the rest of my working life to these kinds of projects. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about Main Street to locate Main Street. Why do we call it Main Street Project? Everybody, It's kind of a hard name, actually, to like, make the connection to. But it was started about 10 years ago uh, as an effort to really create pathways towards community wealth. We, uh, I wasn't there at that time, but the, I knew the folks that started it were really, really devoted to uh, working with immigrant farmers and wannabe farmers. Uh, and we called it the Main Street Project because at the time everyone was talking about dwindling Main Street. <clears throat> and at the heart of the Main Street, why was that happening? Well, we, you know, the assessment then, the analysis was that in order to strengthen Main Street in these rural places, we need to strengthen the conditions around these communities and to rebuild those connections between the, the soil, uh, the land around, and small uh, businesses. <clears throat> so the Main Street Project got its name that way. Over the first couple of years, we worked uh, in uh, Latino communities at that time and did a full community-engaged assessment kind of thing. And what we heard over and over again, when we asked them, well, like, what can we do together? How could we raise the you know, viability of your livelihood? What can we do? It came back over and over again to food security and health, you know, better food. Um, healthier ways to live together, rebuilding our communities. And um, what was born out of that was first a whole wave of um, CSAs, community gardens. But after a year of that, that everybody said, w we want to raise chickens. I am not a chicken farmer. I just want to, but these, you know, that just came up loud and clear. Ch chicken was a universal um, food and the universal animal. And um, my co-conspirator and really the founder of this system, Reynaldo um, Hazlitt Mariquin, from Guatemala, uh, indigenous in his agricultural practices and upbringing, deeply educated uh, at the university there in Guatemala, was the leader in this assessment. And it was really Reiki, along with the community all the way back then, that started really trying to figure out what would work and we came up with this model of connecting poultry to perennials. And so seven years later, after a lot of R&D, here's the position we're in. So that's a little bit of background in um, Main Street. <clears throat> Again, um, I'm, we're here because we were financed. We ended up, um, in the last two years, being able to purchase a 100-acre farm near Northfield, Minnesota. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, and uh, our experience with the Iroquois Valley, which I'll also talk a little bit towards the end, has just it's ma made it possible for us to pursue uh, this avenue, which, you know, at the very heart of it, makes it possible for us to replicate and build this regional effort. This is a system level um, application, and so we spent years building the model, but now we're trying to move this model out to um, many communities in southeast Minnesota. So that's a little bit about the background, and I'm going to go to slide two. Well, before I go back to that other, other, other way, I just wanted to point out, because we don't, I, so I tried to do this really in 10 minutes. There's going to be a couple short <coughs> videos. That's an example of one of our chicken coops. Um, I'm going to bring Rehi into the room here at the little one minute description, but um, that chicken coop there was built for about 500. Uh, egg layers, and when you hear the idea of a paddock, this is a great picture of it. Our poultry model has at the heart of it a stationary coop, a paddock around it, perennials inside the paddock, 
with a canopy that protects the chickens. So the chickens rotate around in this paddock. So um, I just wanted to, that's a pretty good picture of that. So. And I'm also the chief operating officer there. I forgot to tell you. That's how I'm working with the leadership team right now. And I helped uh, lead the acquisition effort for the land. So, so poultry center regenerative agriculture is what we've kind of named this thing. And I, I think it's interesting. Every, all the, I was very tuned to the whole co uh, conversation about organic versus regenerative, I want to just say that we're not the folks that are saying, oh, this is beyond organic. That's not our intention. We think organic is essential, absolutely at the heart of everything we do. It's really about uh, a set of system characteristics that we uh, adhere somewhat to because we're also permaculture based and uh, holistic management. So when we use that term, it's really about the whole of it and organic is central to what we do. Um, and again, <clears throat> Our permaculture design uh, is really has that, that essence of it, that kind of triple thing, which is about you know um, earth care, care for the earth, care for people, and fair share, which also kind of fits our building blocks and how we design the system. So with that in mind, um, the third piece here just shows a few shots, and I call it the building blocks. Um, our work really embodies the triple bottom line, which often is used in business settings and all sorts of things, and I get a little tired of it, but from our perspective, I want to just point out that we put the social aspect first. This has got to work for the farmer. Um, it's got to work for the farmer's sense of uh, security and health, and so we start with the social. Our second piece of that is the economic, and beyond the farmer, we want to keep the wealth in the community. And so we have a set of guidelines and indicators that are really about how we measure that. Are we keeping the wealth here? Is our community stronger? Are our farmers happy? <laughs> All of that is really central. And the ecological piece, <clears throat> if you really flow from that, it's also, you know, it's strong on that because everything we do with the permaculture design and the way in which we designed our farm points at um, soil care, res restoration of the soil, as well as um, we're very concerned about water quality. And, you know, that's kind of central to our ecological benefits. Um, so I want to talk a little bit before I go on to this a little one minute thing is that we are located in an area in Minnesota that had, you know, quote unquote, marginal soil that over the years uh, has been farmed um, and had a lot of um, tiling, which is about, you know, moving the water off the land quickly. We also have a lot of water in that land. And so when we talk about nitrates, the, those first slides, we're at the core of that because our land, the water moves quickly through the tiling system, dumps into these small dredge, you know, ditches which go directly into, right now, our farm abuts against Mud Creek, which flows into Cannon River, which flows directly into that Mississippi. So that area in there, which is typically called the Minnesota River Basin, is, last I read, responsible for upwards to 40 to 50 percent of that dead zone that you were talking about. It's a volatile area that's been over farmed. So part of what we're trying to do is build another way for farmers to get off of the corn and soybean rotation or monoculture, which is prevalent there, uh, even with soil that really can't take it. Um, and so our model has that sort of shifting that agricultural practices and being able to demonstrate to other farmers how to do that as well as working with Latino families sort of in, in, in tandem. And we like that in tandem because we mix it up that way. That's how we really build the diversity of our system. It's not just for our established farmers, it's for everybody. So with that in mind, I'm gonna have, this is a little, we have a wonderful young guy who is a great videographer and we really, really try to document everything we're doing. We have a lot of videos on our website and I wanted to introduce you to Rehi here. He's gonna give you one minute about the paddock and the system. I am Reginaldo Haslin Marroquin. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Main Street Project in Minnesota. 
Back in 2006, uh, we came to a realization that in order to change things at a large scale in the conditions of the immigrant communities, especially those from Latin America that currently support this illusion that there is such thing as cheap food, we had to engage something at a large scale. So what we said was, what if we were able to redesign the way we grow poultry? So we came up with this idea where we established perennial crops and created a canopy, which is natural to the evolutionary process of poultry, and incorporated native species to that canopy. And then we worked with the understory to create conditions where poultry will grow healthy and will give us good quality products. The end result is a much healthier soil. We restored that soil at the same time that we are restoring the capacity of these families to participate in this large scale system under a whole new set of conditions. Here. One minute, I thought it would take me 10. <laughs> so I said, can we do a video? Um, so anyway, that gives you a little bit of background about the model itself. And uh, now I want to talk a little bit next um, about this farm. So why did we need a farm? Um, we had our farmers spread out over three sites that were all under short-term leases um, with seven coops. Uh, we have a very strong training component to our work and in order for people to learn the system, first they go through a little bit of a classroom orientation, but mainly they're out in the coops and they're working with us in the coops and they actually own their own flocks. So how we work towards this sort of sense of business and entrepreneurship is for them to take responsibility <coughs> of a flock of chickens. One flock of chicken in our coop is about 1,200 birds and so we had, you know, and so and those coops can sustain three to four flocks a year, and we had spread out. So you're starting to get the idea here. So we had coops in three different sites, driving people around, just wasn't going to work. Plus, we couldn't, um, we really couldn't build the community that we needed to. And without that community and having a sense of the whole, we knew we couldn't launch the system into the region. So we started looking for land uh, about a year and a half ago, and. The, I knocked on doors, and this is a great picture because this um, is a picture. This is our existing R&D site uh, where we do. We had a couple different uh, coops there, and of course, we were looking over here next door. Here's the farmer, the Wasners, who'd been on this land for five generations. They had rented it the last 20 years, corn on corn on corn, uh, and that big area back there. You see, that's the land that we ended up acquiring. So it took us about a year and a half to work with these uh, farmers. I was really um, uh, interested, Rory, where are you in your story about what it's like to work? Yes, in a community. So these guys really took a lot of, I mean, <laughs> they had been there. They were pillars in the community. <laughs> Their kids didn't want to farm. And they were really interested in doing something different. And you know, everything from, the restaurants to the church to, I mean, it took a lot for them to step up and it took a long time for them to figure it out. We really supported them in doing that. It helped that a lot of us had farming background. Uh, and when they finally made the plunge uh, to say, yes, we'll go, then it took another half year to figure out how that would work. We're a nonprofit in the state of Minnesota. Um, we can only own 40 acres, so one of our big partners came out of nowhere. It was a marvelous couple that had just moved from Saudi Arabia, um, Muslim woman who had worked hard to preserve the mangroves there, um, and she wanted nothing more than to help restore soil here, because she had been there. And she heard about us, took a tour, went to a class that I was teaching, and knocked on the door moved to Northfield, she was living in the cities at the time, with her husband and kids, and walked in and said, we'll help you. Um, boom, wow, that made, that, so that made this 100 acres possible, but then the big question was, how, was we gonna, you know, how are we gonna finance the 40 acres? Uh, with the nonprofit that had a $500,000 operating budget, which was grant and due. So that's a little bit about the why of this farm. Um, I'm not gonna show you our, the team, so we you can move it to the next and so this is our team right now that's on the farm so we don't have one farmer but um we have a really diverse group um most everybody's bilingual and um we have uh, seven of us now one two three four five six seven so i just wanted to show you the diversity of the team and also to say 
Um, all of us are working together. And you can see in the background there, that's our elderberries, which is one of our crops. Um, so the whole um, marvel of chicken manure combined with these perennials right now, elderberries is one of our crops, hazelnuts is another, which you saw in the paddocks. That's really the gold, it's the chickens scratching around, <laughs> doing their thing. Um, so we have our group here. Uh, we have our fa farm managers, Wilbur uh, and Rocky, Rahi, who you met, um, Bob Kell, who's been our training director and is wonderful Latino in the community. Myself, Will's the one who does all the videography, and Neil's one of the founders, Neil Ritchie. So I wanted to bring those folks into the room, and then the next slide shows you examples of current farmers and people who are working. So this is just kind of a consortium of pictures. We have trained about 70 farmers in the last seven years that are Latino. Uh, somebody asked me, I think it was, I can't remember, Alex maybe, who, how many folks actually make it? <laughs> so training wise, um, I can say out of the 70 that we have about 10 farmers teed up right now that would like to build their own coops. We could do this on less than two acres of land. So that's really where we're at, is trying to place farmers now out of this hub farm. Is it, I apologize. Yeah. Is it sustainable on two acres of land to build a coop and you can make a living? You can't make a full living, no, no. If you want to combine more land or live in community or share, a lot of our farmers are working cooperatively and so you can definitely make around $5,000, around $5,000 with all things, you know, here and there about $5,000 a flock. And so people are running three flocks. You can kind of see how that starts to add up. And then we also combine the perennial crops with that. And I'm happy to share more about the numbers as well. Next slide. Um, let's see, where are we at here? Oh, OK. So we did get this land purchased in May. So it's brand new. But we just started designing it. So this is a permaculture design just to put that up there. So you can see some of the elements here. Uh, we do have quite a bit of land that's already in conservation easement, um, upwards to around 20 acres. Uh, this is part of that. The road is here. You can see the buffers. The creek I just talked about is to the left. This, most of this is on contour. Uh, the contours are, are planted in alley crops and alley you know, rows that in our elderberries, hazelnuts, we're leaving space for alley crops such as garlic, which is a very big uh, interest in the Latino community, black beans and other things. So that's going to be kind of a combo there. Obviously, this is meant to be a re uh, research and development farm. We do a lot of RD, and we also do a lot of demonstration and field activity and invite groups out there. There's people out there all the time. So there's social spaces and educational spaces over here, are, we will have upwards to seven coops all in one area once we start building that. What you can't see here very easily is all the hydrological uh, restoration work. So we're, we're restoring three wetlands here. Um, there's going to be a whole lot of work towards that water management piece. So um, we move to the next. Now what I'm going to do is just show you a quick, so we acquired the land in May. We're in the establishment phase. A lot of this is going to take years. But as soon as we got the land, we just started working. So we had a lot of people from the community come out and help with this. And we were able to, to uh, plant 9,000 hazelnuts in the first three weeks. We had a tree planter. <laughs> it was a scene. <laughs> And uh, the other thing that is kind of, you know, it's sitting in the middle of this is because we've been working on this for so long. We have commons-based nurseries, we call them, that are, we've been propagating um, plant material, which is one of the biggest obstacles for a farmer to be able to make this transition. So we've been planting hazelnuts and planting elderberries and then coppicing and planting more. So we had enough plant material to get that much out there. So I'm going to just give you a taste of what it looks like to go on the land and hit it this way and it was uh, it was the first three weeks so go ahead. there's the raw land nineteen fifty seven drill <laughs> Yeah. 
can see the wetlands. Here we're measuring the contours. So this is the tree planter putting in the hazelnuts. So it's bare root that's going into the ground here. Mulching, that was quite a day. This is what the coops will look like. <laughs> This is a hazelnuts, and of course we do have some egg production going on. We tested that. <laughs> anyway, all right. So, <laughs> so just to finish up, I wanted to show you the region. Our goal is to spread this system. It's a system and that's really at the heart of what we do in so many ways. And this is another reason why Iroquois Valley has been so important. Um, our obstacles are financing, land access, building the markets that are gonna promote and pull all of this forward. Um, that's pretty true across anywhere where you would be starting something new. You know, Iroquois Valley to us represents um, an uncompromising way to think about financing. And when I talk about Iroquois Valley, and that's probably my, my last slide here, because it almost brings me to tears. Um, so, you know, Iroquois Valley is the real deal. And so I've dealt a lot uh, in the investing community and have looked for money and have done a lot of that. But the thing I can say unequivocally is that you guys put the farmers first and at the center of what you do. And this team of folks, <laughs> really gets what it means to do that. And so for us, I mean, there was a lot of work to make this happen. It wasn't an easy transaction. I mean, the, it's $300,000, but uh, Dave was in there with us trying to figure it out. Um, the terms were really great. We were able to work with our investors also, think about the whole exit strategy and tying these parcels together. We worked on that. Um, and when I talk about Iroquois, I really, I love this uh, quote. <laughs> Because this is a quote that was on a WPA poster that I inherited a while back. And I thought, like, wow, we are thinking back about that in the 30s. Yes. A nation that destroys its soil, destroys itself. Uh, and so for me to be here is just a real honor for our group to have been supported by our farmers, the farmers that you support. I'd love to invite anybody who wants to come and see us anytime. And I think that's probably what I have to say right now. So thank you. Questions? Um, where did you get hazelnuts? Pardon? Where did, trees? where did we get them? Right. We, we got our hazelnuts from Mark Shepard, who's down in Viroqua. All right. Yep, and he's, yeah, he's got a regenerative farm down there, and, his, and we you know, did a little deal with him, which is he had a whole lot in stock. We started planting, and he has been supportive. Other such people around our area have also been supportive. Um, you know, it's a real radical concept to start giving things away. <laughs> Where? Yeah, well, I'd love to talk about that. So. Yes? Uh, the question for you is that the workshop I've been told the time to produce a chicken right is 90 days. I've been told that Tyson does it in 30 days, and they apparently use BGH for this. Yeah. How long does it take you to produce a chicken, and how can you remain competitive? That kind of well, that's the competitive thing, of course, is all about scale and all that. We can talk more about that. But I'll say our chickens take 75 days um, right now. That's average. We use heritage 
ran chickens, they're, they're called freedom fighters, which is, <laughs> I know, they really are called freedom fighters. And the, the, you know, I'd like to talk more about, I'd, I'd love to tee up all those questions and talk to you over, you know, a meal or drinks, but you know, for us, that's part of why we're about a system. And that's part of what we're trying to do is build over time. Our goal is 30 coops in the next three years. Um, you know, depending on what, what kind of arrangements we can make with the, the marketing side of that, um, that's really what we're pointed at right now. So we can't be competitive in the present system. Um, we do know that we can sell all of our chickens, anything that we, you know, Bon Appetit is our big marketing partner right now, and they've taken most everything. We have two big drop sites. But to change a system, you know, at that competitive level is sort of what we're all, I think, trying to figure out. Is there a connection some of us might not be aware of between poultry and the Latino community? Is there anything there that's... Well, it's kind of the universal um, meat, and so the connection really was cu cultural in terms of what that's what they wanted to grow and that's what they like to eat. It's the meat. It's the not meat. the eggs so much? The eggs, you know, also, but the egg, yeah. But they were really about the meat when we first started this model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's true, re remembering again, you know, with Rehi's connection from Guatemala, we work in other areas in the world, Guatemala, San Miguel, the Thunder, you know, Thunder, we've got a lot of different sites out there, and so chicken is kind of universal also from a global perspective. It's just part of how we learn. What we, it's a, that transfer and translation is really important to us and what we're doing. Yes? Um, oh. Most people still believe eggs are white, and as you all know, yours are white. <laughs> making them white does to them. What was the process of making eggs white? Do you think the should... I wish I could answer that. My, my expertise is more on pigs. <laughs> but I don't know the answer to that. Somebody here might know the answer to that. I mean, yeah. well, is that really, is it that simple? Okay. <laughs> It's just a breed. It's just a breed. See, so having never grown white chickens, I didn't know that. So. Did you have a question that? Yes, we do. They're not so far away in terms, of, you know, distance-wise. And there's a great project there called the um, Hafa. Yep, which is. Yeah, and, and of course their, their goals are somewhat different than ours in terms of what they're doing, you know, providing space for vegetable gardening <laughs> and the, the farmer's markets. And, but we do know those folks well and totally love what they're doing. There's a little bit of back and forth, but not a lot. It's interesting. Are yes. you active in other states too? Pardon? Are you active in other states? Yes, we are active in um, a couple of other states. Happy to share that with you. Our probably biggest other sister project right now, though, is in San Miguel, and we're at the Pine Ridge Reservation, which is in South Dakota. We have a, a new co-op that's starting in Guatemala, and there's some interest in Haiti. So again, this model is easier put into those kinds of communities. It's been hard to break through here. That's a longer conversation. <laughs> yes? What do you do with your hazelnuts? Well, our hazelnuts, of course, being a perennial crop, and the fact that we're just now planting <coughs> 9,000 hasn't been a real big deal, but we are hopefully building relationships with some um, niche markets as well as trying to put enough hazelnuts in the ground that we can actually provide that ballast in the pull for our new industry. That's part of why the system is so important and why we're trying to plant thousands. I mean, our goal in the region is, a, is something like 500 acres of hazelnuts to actually make, lift this up. I mean, this is a long-term project that's been invested in here, so. Yes? I'll say if brother tried to grow chickens would be nine or that, but what do you think? Nothing could go wrong and they all got gobbled up by whatever. Predators. <laughs> How, how do you protect them? They're just out running around here. That's what protects them. Hazelnuts. The hazelnuts protect them. They can. They are forest animals. Chickens are not pasture animals. In fact, they're terrified on pasture, which is one of the reasons our chickens produce so well, because they're so calm and secure. But, you know, that's been part of our thing. Now, that's not to say there aren't wonderful chickens that are grown out on pasture. Our thing, though, is to cover them up. So we haven't had any predator. Yeah. 
It's just a really funny thing. We have a video about this on our site right now that shows the hawk flying over, shows the chickens going. <laughs> and it's like they know when the hawk is, yeah, it's just ironic. Rory. So you guys are certified organic? No. You're not. not. We hope to be. Obviously, we're going to be. <laughs> you don't understand the new rules that are going through when in fact, as far as that goes. What are your thoughts on the, the poultry rules specifically? Are, are they trying to require the pasture mm. for the chickens? And what are your thoughts on that? I know there's a lot of, I feel it's one way or another, you know, a lot of older. Well, we've been focused on non-GMO and organic feed. Um, so everything that we feed is that. Um, and, you know, obviously our land is not organic yet, and so we're focused on that. And so in the group, that's sort of where we stand on that. Any other questions? And then more specifics on numbers and things like that, we can, I'm happy to try to answer, but I can't. Thank you.